This session is a bit special because what we want is uh, the whole issue when you talk about operationalizing CSR, there is one, the issue of governance when you talk about the whole issue as I spoke in the morning, the whole issue of how will you get the, the whole committee in place and the committee has to also sink in what activities they have to do and how they have to do. But in this session what we will discuss today and I want this, your, your participation uh, to see that uh, we are thinking of asking questions beforehand so that you know we want to encourage people to participate in this. This session will address the whole issues and the challenges of the, of the practitioners, the CSR heads who are you know uh, heading the foundations, heading the, the organization CSR vertical and if they can you know uh, showcase or tell about their problems, challenges they are facing with their uh, program and how, what are the problems they are facing because their problems can be, they are different problems, they can be problems of implementation, problems of impact, problems of efficiency, effectiveness, of partnership and all that. So what we will do is we will ask our panelists, we have a very distinguished uh, panel today from various walks of life, so we will ask those uh, practitioners those questions. But before I start, I want three questions from you, from you all three questions and then we deliberate on those three questions because what will happen will be that you know I want to have a quick panel and quick session so that you know your questions should be answered first and those questions will be our you know they will become our preamble for this panel. So this is what the, the style of we will change the style so that you are first and then we will answer those questions but no observations please I am I'm sorry I don't have time for observation only questions if you have three questions crisp question happy to take those questions. Yeah. Hi, I'm Harsh uh, from an organization called Sarthak Prayas. Uh, as you all know, there are 20 lakh NGOs uh, in India, but only 400 to 500 NGOs are visible. So corporates also look for brand name, credibility, and different credentials before they give funds to different NGOs. What are corporates doing to actually assess different new NGOs, probably who are grassroots level, who are doing some different work, and has some credentials or parameters that you should have this kind of budget, this kind of experience, or this kind of capability before we fund you? Very so, good. Very good question. Thank you. So we will deliberate on this question because that's a very relevant question, and then we will come back to the next question because then you know we don't want to take the second question and confuse our panelists on that. So my question to Madhuna is: Is that when you talk about your Vodafone Foundation, the Vodafone investing on community development and CSI investment, how do you really assess one? How do you advertise about? Uh, partnerships and how? what is the process you take and, and that's very relevant to say that out of 3.2 million organizations only if 100 or maybe I'll say 100 or 400 organizations who are very very prominent so what, how, what is the process you take? So hi good afternoon everybody so happy to be here and I hope uh, my comments or input will uh, you know add some value to what you're hoping to ask. The Vodafone Foundation itself in India is a fairly uh, new entity, but currently the process we are following is uh, we announce open houses, uh, either on our social media or on our different parameters in which, uh, through which we reach out to the communities, and uh, we invite NGOs to come and be a part of deliberations. So our basic modus operandi is since our areas of operation are education, agriculture and inclusivity with a focus on women and uh, technology is sort of the bedrock of everything that we undertake using this extremely powerful tool that we have at our behest to ensure that development is maximum and has scale. Uh, we do try and uh, ensure that uh, known, obviously known, known names in this uh, area or NGOs which are existing are reached out to but through social media, through our uh, uh, websites etc the process is to release uh, uh, the problem statement to try and see where and how can organizations partner who are dealing live with that problem statement either at the implementation stage or at the aggregator stage secondly uh, very importantly we would announce geographies 
So while there may be very valuable organizations in one geography, there may be a reason which may be based on the national development agenda or personally the corporate's interest to see where the geographies are, where the NGOs might lie. And then there's a standard process of inviting concept notes which go up in our case to our board committee, etc. The shortlisted ones are asked for proposal and then there is a due diligence process to see which ones will get. To just add a little bit to uh, the second part of your question, there is also a criteria. Obviously, every corporate has a different corpus that it's hoping to disperse. Based on the corpus, they'll have to put an eligibility criteria because I have, say, uh, uh, funds to give in, uh, you know, three figures or two figures. It's very it's very uh, difficult for me to have small scale projects. So I am looking at some kind of scale for the better management from my end and also for a better reach scale and impact. So in that sense, we would look at certain organizations and put some <coughs> eligibility criteria to say, you should have been able to have handled funds of this kind. This should be your constitution. The Vodafone Foundation itself uh, requires an organization to be FCRA for us to share with them. So then there are those standard compliances which come into place either from a quantitative angle or a qualitative angle. I hope that, uh, I mean, that's as far as yeah. the Vodafone Foundation goes. Thank you, Manju, for your comments on this. Manju, if you look at Yes Foundation, because Yes Foundation, earlier, you know, the, the responsibility, uh, responsible banking and the whole issue of, of Yes Banking, now the Yes Foundation, which is Yes and the Change and all that. How do you deliberate on Yes and the Change if you look at that program and looking at partnerships? Uh, so I, I'll take uh, the question from both sides because uh, we have a central uh, CSR team uh, which sits under responsible banking and we have a foundation as well. So uh, from a, a foundation side when we look at partners, the Yes and the Change program of foundation is actually a, a national uh, movie making competition on social change. So. Uh, uh, it's actually using media as a um, medium to uh, engage with people to create social change and create films. So, uh, if I'm looking at partnerships, I'm looking at uh, engagements uh, on that line, we'll uh, need a basic uh, understanding that the movie making and sourcing. So, uh, there are two aspects. One, uh, there should be an expertise on movie making, uh, on uh, uh, say uh, how to uh, edit movies on uh, this is basic technical aspects the other thing is how do we reach out to maximum number of people because uh, at the end of the day I'll be asked on how many uh, movies that were made how many people how many youth that we actually mobilize to uh, create uh, the impact that we want to create uh, the, uh, when I'm talking about measurements on impacts I'll actually uh, measure how many youth did I mobilize uh, through this uh, program. So this is the second part. So these two uh, pay, uh, play the maximum role. Uh, and uh, coming to the question where uh, we said new new NGOs do not get uh, visibility or do not get the funding. Uh, I'll take an example of uh, one of uh, our projects which is just started rolling out, which is uh, uh, the uh, Save the Gate Great Indian Buster project. Uh, in that project, uh, uh, because it was a wildlife uh, kind of project, we had to consult WWF and BNHS, which is the largest uh, kind of uh, uh, more uh, from a think tank perspective. Uh, and we selected uh, as BNHS as the implementing entity. But when we dig, uh, dig deeper, that uh, the actual is something which is related to the community and the community which is around the area of the Desert National Park. We will, uh, and uh, a basic concern is water availability and through the year. Now, BNHS might not be able to provide that, and therefore, uh, say Jal Bhagirati, which was doing some kind of uh, water initiatives in that area, came into picture and it got involved in the same project. So, it's not that small uh, regional or small uh, players are not getting involved. Uh, based on their own expertise. The uh, biggest thing that we look uh, is how is the expertise of the uh, in delivery. There is a, a particular kind of say requirement. If there is uh, uh, say water uh, 
related issues to be handled through an NGO at Rajasthan. So this is a very clear cut requirement that we are looking at when we are looking for so, No, no, this is helpful because you know one is extending that partnership and all that. So again, you know, one sub if if you can also talk about the process. You know, we are more uh, interested in how the process in terms of one is that you are advertising uh, that you know what concept note you, you want to take, what are the thematic areas. And once the NGOs approach you, what is the process then? You know, if you can, in a, in a uh, brief, we can talk about. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, at NDCC, we normally uh, we don't accept the request. All our requests for any of the thematic area has to be routed through the district administration either to the district administration or the district authorities. That is the primary thing that, that is our CSR board has laid out a guideline. And uh, we normally don't do any philanthropy, we don't do any charity. All our uh, CSR works are project based. Like we are doing toilets, last year we did 100 toilets across India in schools. This year also we are doing in Delhi with urban local bodies. And we do other areas like skill development that work we tendered through the NSDC training partners. Then certain any other activity that is normally tendered. So we normally don't work with the NGOs, it is, it, all of our goals are tendered and uh, the whatever the tender basis, the, who, whichever agency comes, we have certain laid out stringent guidelines, whichever agency comes, who, uh, who are able to comply with those guidelines, they are doing that work. Yeah, good. Now this is very good because the thing is one side we are talking to the corporate sector and the private sector. You know, both sides, uh, the, the public sector and the private sector. The uh, private sector is then looking at crowdsourcing of ideas, crowdsourcing of, of NGOs, you know, different partnerships and all that. Where, you know, uh, similarly in the, in the last panel also, Sanjeev spoke about the whole program and project which were coming through the district administration and all that. The thinking here is also that how you are involving the district which is important now. For example, a lot of people still feel that you know PSUs. If we go with the request, they will be it will be easier to get money. So good to good to get that. I want to go to. I, I will just add one small thing also. Whatever request we get get from the district administration, they very clearly give us in writing that they will maintain the project. They will give us the land. Uh, they will maintain it also. And uh, uh, sustainability is important. Sustainability is okay. there. The water, light, electricity, everything they will provide. Okay, great. So I, now going back, to uh, your your comments on this. That when you look at, you're also a, a, a PSU, public sector organization. So from your, what kind of partnerships you are building? Yeah, I'm Deshpande from Rashtriya Chemicals and Fertilizers Limited. You are 50 year old company. And our basic uh, this thing is farmer because we are in fertilizers. And as far as NGO or CSR is concerned, we are not having any idea that this is called CSR because all public sectors were already doing it. And just prior to few years back, when Department of Public Enterprises came out with uh, some mandate or some, some guidelines. Yeah. That time we realized, yes, this is CSR which we are doing since day one. Right. Right. Second thing, as far as NGO is concerned, our NGO, in-house NGO, we have an in-house NGO, that is from our uh, employees. That itself is 48 years old and they are doing fantastic work. We are supporting them and we have been supporting them. The thing we did not uh, participate directly with NGO since last so many years was we had a very good cell, separate cell for doing all these type of activities and that activity is called IRDP that is Integrated Rural Merit, uh, Development and uh, through which uh, we were trying to develop villages and uh, doing all CSR activities basically. When we came to urban CSR, that time we engaged Tata Institute of Social Sciences and uh, through them we are conducting uh, various CSR activities in and around our uh, this thing, nearby areas. As far as engaging process is concerned, uh, of course we have gone through process as uh, being public sector, we have to follow certain process and uh, through approvals and all, uh, like Madam said, 
we have got all those things in place. Correct. No, no, but now if, if you, how, how this question has become, your question has become relevant because now you have got three, four views to yes. say one is going through the district administration, other is going through, you know, partnership. Yes. If we go to, now UN Women, Nishta, you know, Nishta heads the, uh, the, uh, the development, business development, and also looking at how resource mobilization happens in, in the UN Women. She will talk about how they are looking at fund creation on, from CSR perspective. Sure. So I think the first the first thing is to acknowledge that uh, it is true that a lot of the funds do get dispersed to the top 10 or 20 NGOs and the smaller NGOs that are really working on the margins, especially in smaller states, don't really come to the fore. And that is an issue and that's an issue that UN Women is dedicated to work towards. Uh, but there are reasons uh, that that doesn't happen very well and the reasons is sometimes when we do get proposals, what we assess or what anybody assesses probably is for sustainability, scale and impact. Right. And these questions have to be answered very specifically right at the forefront in very clear words. Now these, this needs capacity. Right? Now not all small NGOs are investing in building those kind of concept notes that very clearly respond to the asks of the donor. Uh, but that's that and that's an issue that can be solved and that's the good news. Uh, now what are we doing at UN Women is we of course uh, have made it a point that we will only implement through NGOs and we are not getting into the implementation space because that's not the space for, for the United Nations, right? But we of course are present at the aggregating space, which is where we bring and convene multiple NGOs to come together to deliver on very tangible, large scale and transformative outcomes. Uh, at UN Women, uh, our, our mandate of course is to mainstream gender into CSR projects. We are looking to develop the gender center that will be established within the Indian Institute of Corporate Affairs that will bring together uh, large scale programs uh, targeted at gender. Right, and we'll probably in the course of this conversation talk about that a lot more. Okay. No, I think what is important here is that different organizations, different companies or different uh, uh, organizations have a different way uh, of, of dealing with, with partnerships. So you see, you know, a lot of people, if, I, if you look at now not-for-profit organization or NGO or in the, in the modern technology, the voluntary sector, the, the, the sector has also to evolve and do kind of a research to see what organization they are targeting and what are the expectations or aspirations they have. Right. So both sides you have to see the aspiration of both the parties. Then the whole you know practitioner's point of view is important. Okay. So that's what uh, the thing is. We'll take the second question. Yeah. So uh, lady, we we'll just take the lady and then we'll take the third question. Thank you so much. Uh, while we were talking about partnerships, I would like to take it a step further about implementation. Uh, we, I'm from Humana, People to People India, and I've, we've been partners with many corporate entities. So th with that experience, what we have found has been that there is a kind of a dilemma. Uh, probably it is because it's still so new. And, uh, your your you know, question, please. Yeah, so it is because most of the corporates want to do development, but most of the development is more infrastructural, like a hardware. Uh, hmm. Where is the behavior change? Where are the people? And in that sense, if we are thinking along those lines, how do we take the people along, bring that sustainability angle in implementing these things? Okay. So your question is, if I've understood, is that a lot of uh, emphasis from the company is investment into infrastructure project, not behavior change as the software part of it. Yes. It's not there. Yeah. So the so question to the panelists is, I think we'll go with Nishta first, is, is, is the whole thinking about, when you talk about infrastructure investment, do, what is in your mind when you make an investment? Sure. So I think you're probably the most favorite person I have in the room right now because uh, we at Human Women deal with issues like patriarchy that are not solved overnight, right? So there are intended and unintended impact uh, of, the co of the Companies Act that mandates uh, corporates to really be a stakeholder or come in as a state principal stakeholder development. The unintended impact of all of this is the, what we call the marketization of development. Right, which is the move from basically a welfare approach to more market-oriented approaches to development. Uh, is that good? Yes, in some ways. Is that bad? I wouldn't really say bad, but what that has led to is uh, corp the application of corporate metrics to development projects. Right. To some extent, the good part of it, it is boosted efficiency, reporting, transparency, governance, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. But what it has also done is it has compelled the development sector to shift focus 
from touch and feel, quick returns, right, to long-term results, which is transformative in nature, right? Because companies have to spend annually, they are thinking annually, right? The results are annual. When you think of annual results, it cannot be behavior changes. It cannot be a mindset change. Does that mean the development sector needs to stop working on that? Absolutely not, right? So it is therefore your mandate and your burden to convince and prove that behavior change is the step to a larger transformative changes. What is the way to do that? Uh, there are specific results-based management frameworks that are applicable to behavior changes, right? It is a tough battle, and I go through that every single day of my life, right, when you're sitting in front of a corporate. Uh, it is a tough battle, but there are specific indicators that you can use to measure changes, right, or measure change in a way that's explainable, in a way that, if I don't want to use the word, but in a way that's sellable, right? And therefore, it is really your burden to push uh, the focus from infrastructure touch and feel results to more long term, which can be achieved on a, on a medium or a short term, right? Yeah. So, and, and, and there is also a comment that a lot of uh, companies don't fund infrastructure projects. So I maybe go to Madhu and, and ask her comments on this. Yeah. So just, just three short comments. One, uh, I completely agree with Parul to say that um, Infrastructure might be the mandate of some, but there are very varied agendas on the uh, strategy boards of corporates. And for Vodafone Foundation per se, we look at technology as the intervention we come up with. In fact, we don't encourage setup costs, we try and use technology to sort of uh, impact sustainability and scale. And I know there are many others who have varied mandates going all the way from wildlife to conservation to um, you know, poverty reduction, education, I don't think infrastructure really sits at the center of every strategy. That's one. Secondly, when we talk about the fact that yes, corporates do have to look at their budgets annually, disbursals annually, but I do think that there is a certain amount of clear understanding on the development professionals at the corporate side as well, that programs are long standing. So while their budgeting and their disbursements and utilizations might be a process that needs to be reported annually, there can definitely be a program which is stretched over a period of time, whatever is logically applicable to it, or whatever it mandate, uh, you know, its mandates and its impacts might be. As far as metrics go, again, uh, while I completely appreciate Nishtar's point to say that you know um, there are different ways of measurement that uh, awareness levels need to be raised to, I think there's a fair amount of acceptability in terms of what kind of results a kind of program will have. There's certain which really require behavioral change and early intervention at the center of it. Others might require infrastructure, others might require technology. I think the, uh, the uh, push from our end is on reporting and on credible monitoring. The metrics themselves can just speak for the program and just sort of you know report back on what is the reality. I don't think there is that much of a stress on what those metrics might be, but let 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 there be some metrics and let them come back. So uh, again, from the public sector, you know, I want to comment. You know, if, if you to that, see, I'd like to give you. There cannot be a blanket uh, behavioral change. If it is not uh, in every aspect, a behavioral change is required. Last year we did for schools. In schools, the behavioral change is not required. In the once we put it in a, uh, in a school, the teacher will instruct the other students have to go to the park to all of them. A behavioral change is not required. This behavioral change may be required in a public or a community toilet. It may be required at least. But once even if you put in a say in a Ramana Loya hospital, there you don't require any behavioral change. Automatically patients, their relatives will go there. So it cannot be a uniform pattern, number one. Number two, I'm trying to we do number of skill development programs. The last year we did in a place called Barrage with one of the NSDC training partners. So it was such a good program. A young girl, she trained herself and now she is doing digitization of the ration cards and earning 5,000 rupees. So automatically that soft skill development has come over it in the public. And moreover, like another, we do infrastructure programs. So like these toilets are required. So toilets we are providing. So it is not necessarily the emphasis on infrastructure. We do both soft skills also, infrastructure also. Uh, inclusive health also. So depending whatever the requirements are there, duly approved, where they uh, they give us in writing, we, have, we don't have funds. So all those things we consider and then go ahead. Thank you. Yeah, uh, so uh, it is, uh, I think, well understood by uh, even the corporate sector that awareness is very important. 
and wherever it uh, it uh, it might not be in all the projects as such. But uh, just to uh, go back to one of the examples that uh, we have, uh, we have a uh, say setup of a bank which is not like a very big manufacturing unit or a very big unit which has a lot of uh, uh, its maximum number of employees sitting at one place. We have a spread out uh, uh, location. We we have like uh, 700 branches now, and these branches can be mobilized to do essentially what uh, uh, you are saying that awareness. Because if I try to do one project at each branch and each product is a say even a say 50 lakhs, it will be a very huge budget. So we reduce the budget for each branch. Each branch gets per month two activities, uh, especially uh, say environment or social as activities which are driven centrally. And it is basically on awareness. It's, uh, you, there are uh, no, uh, say, uh, not very uh, clear kind, uh, uh, guidelines, but the thing is to spread awareness among the community on say environment, on say health, on uh, whatever the topics that we generally take care from a central team. Uh, uh, I'll give you an example in sub uh, here that we did a uh, rhino conservation uh, campaign in Assam. All my branches in Assam actually ran through uh, an activity which was done through uh, uh, all the branches, took two or three schools, they ran a, a painting competition on rhino, uh, developing uh, awareness amongst the children among rhinoceros, which is the state animal of Assam. So that is where the uh, if I say our community or our spread actually helps us in creating awareness. Yeah. No, good. Good to you know know that you know one is from the awareness point of view behavior change on on software soft part of it. But sir, you know I just wanted to comment when you said uh, you know toy make creating toilets and all that. What is happening is if you look at the new survey which we are doing with the World Bank today, is that the whole aspect is. People, when you build 10,000 toilets or 20,000 toilets, and the behavior is not changing. People are using those toilets for storing their goods. So my thinking, no, I'm not taking any comments here. But my thinking is that when you look at all that aspect, behavior change and inculcation of that entire habit or behavior, it will take various years or many years to form. Because if you look at education today, you know education. The, the change of education system and the process will take at least 24 years to come to that level. We are still, you know, student to teacher, you know, uh, relationship where teacher goes and so we'll take your comments in the end. But you know, I'm just moving to the. Sir, you want to add something? Yeah. Yeah. This is just a. You know, See, regarding behavioral change, I'm telling my personal experience, or our personal experience. We adopt villages, and. We uh, support them for two years. The first thing we do, our process is very fixed. We approach the village, like you know, Sarpanch or whosoever is there, and then we call people and we tell them that we are going to adopt this village, we are going to develop. And the first appeal is for Sharamadan. We will provide you money, but you also have to come. So that is the involvement of village people. So when we develop village, we take care of two things, that sustainability has to be there, that uh, behavioral change, that comes first and then we fund money, then we uh, you know, push in money and then we involve, the, involve people and likewise uh, we have developed so many villages and uh, also uh, under that IRDP, skill development, subsidiary uh, uh, you know, uh, occupational uh, development and all, all these things we, uh, uh, we support them and we support them for two years and we are, we make it sure that after these uh, two years they sustain themselves and many of the villages uh, in Maharashtra they call it Tanta Mukta or Adarsha Gram. So many of the villages have been rated as Adarsha Gram and now we don't have to look at them. So that is the behavioral change that we ensure first. No, no, ये बहुत बढ़िया आपने जो जो बताया बहुत ही अच्छा है। But हो क्या रहा है अगर आप जैसे हमने भी काफी काम किया है वैसे जो चलने में था पहले हमने काम किया तो हम यही देखते थे कि पहले जो काम हो पहले गांव में VDC बने। 
विलेज डेवलपमेंट कमेटी बने वाह वो थोड़ा संगठित हो और उसका एक सोच बने उसके बाद जाके उस गांव में काम करें मैं इसलिए मैं हिंदी में शुरू हो गया क्योंकि तो मैं मेरे को कुछ पता है कि यहाँ पे कुछ ऑर्गेनाइजेशन आए हुए हैं जिनको अंग्रेजी में जो हमारा पैनल डिस्कशन चल रहा है उसमें प्रॉब्लम आएगी तो यू नो आई वॉज सजेस्टेड टू यू नो यूज दिस बट इन मेन आई स्टार्टेड यू नो यू स्टार्ट स्पीकिंग इन इंग्लिश तो अब एक और क्वेश्चन लेंगे बिकॉज टाइम हमारा कम है हमारे विजय चड्डा साहब आ चुके हैं नेक्स्ट सेशन के और आई वॉन्ट टू गिव हिम ऑन द माइक ऑन टाइम बिकॉज आई नो ही फ्रॉम अ स्ट्रेट थ्री जी मैन यू नो ही नॉट लाइक टू यू नो ही नॉट वॉट टू वेट सो वन लास्ट क्वेश्चन एंड देन यूज हाँ जी सर Yeah. Hi. Maybe um, we have to take a from him. I, I, you know, I have got a little bit answers. You know, you, I just wanted to ask about: the, Is there any monitoring uh, mechanism? Ha. Maybe no, just Mr. Uh, Nagarki, who matrix ki jo baari. Yeah. Just to know, to know, ki kaise to spend ho raha hai. Is there any monetary uh, monitoring uh, mechanism where the money is being spent and whether the objective is being achieved or not? We, you, you guys are spending a lot of money. right <laughs> but whether you are keeping a mechanism or not I mean, that is my question we will answer that question okay so i am I just i am involved with one organization the people come if we want to give food packets <laughs> they are not baggers you want to give food packet you give money for the machinery equipments and sort of things you know <laughs> not just spend uh, social so sort of uh, media ke samne <laughs> apna आप मिटम ये वाला थर्ड पार्टी एजेंसी अंडर द सीएसआर गाइडलाइंस आपको मिटम इवैल्यूएशन कराना है आपको इंपैक्ट असेसमेंट करना है सो द थर्ड पार्टी इंपैक्ट असेसमेंट हैज टू बी डन हाउ फार दैट हैज बेनिफिटेड द स्टेट होल्डर्स सो दैट ऑल दैट रिपोर्ट्स विल कम यू कैन गिव योरसेल्फ प्रेसेंस एंड सी मिटम विद अ टाइमलाइन डिलीवरेबल सेविंग बैट एंड द व्हाट हैज बीन द अल्टीमेट गेन फॉर द स्टेट होल्डर्स सो ऑब्जेक्टिव हैज टू बी अचीव्ड करेक्ट ऑब्जेक्टिव ऑब्जेक्टिव विल बी अचीव्ड ओनली वंस यू नो वी हैव टू गिव द प्रपोजल वेल विच इज द बेसिक सर्वे यस व्हाट व्हाट यू ऑब्जेक्टिव व्हाट इज सो वंस यू अचीव द टारगेट इट विल कम आउट इन द इंपैक्ट असेसमेंट सो यू शुड हैव मॉनिटरिंग मैकेनिज्म या एग्जैक्टली मैं आपको बोल बता रहा हूं प्रपोजल वेल विच में टाइम एंड डिलीवरेबल एवरीथिंग इज बीइंग डन द प्रैक्टिसिंग प्रोफेशनल पॉइंट ऑफ व्यू यू नो वी आर डूइंग इट टू Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. Yeah. Hi. Last question. Yeah, I'm Abhishek. I'm representing Tech Impact Advisors. Um, um, we are also carrying out a pan-India study and impact analysis of the CSR projects taken up by various corporates. Taking from the uh, previous question, I would like to just take view from every panelist that uh, how do you see employee volunteerism into the corporates? Uh, is it a challenge or it can be utilized or uh, as a like uh, untapped catalyst uh, for carrying out both the behavioral change? and executing the project with in house capabilities of monitoring evaluation and then bringing the responsibility and onus within the organization so your question is that how are you involving your employees yeah. in the work which you are doing in csr right. is it right right okay so please i'll ask you a question no sir i'll answer your question first uh, your question is contradictory i'll ask in csr employees cannot be involved it has to be voluntary so your question uh, cannot say that employees we you want uh, uh, i was using the word employee volunteer yeah. uh, what let me what i understood <laughs> that i'm trying to clarify that was so it has to be voluntary and uh, employees cannot be involved in that the csr cannot be also done for employees uh, from mcc perspective uh, i can say that uh, my board does not want to involve the employees we are hard pressed we have deficit so much of load work targets and uh, the board does not want to involve the employees so even even though personally i am not the employees to be involved but the my management does not okay. so so that is that is his view and his organization view so, so let's let's wait for the comments here jahan tak mai hr board head ho jaise wo saab hai hum log jab bhi employees se milte hain to hum unko bolte hain ki 
हमको समाज ने इतना दिया है कंपनी ने इतना दिया है हम, हमने समाज के प्रति कुछ करना चाहिए ये बोल बोल के बोल बोल के जैसे मैंने आपको बताया कि हमारा पहला जो एनजीओ है वो भी कंपनी 50 साल पुरानी है पहला एनजीओ 48 साल पुराना है तब से वो जो परंपरा चली आ रही है और मैं बहुत ज्यादा इस पर विश्वास रखता हूँ कि यदि किसी भी ऑर्गेनाइजेशन को सस्टेनेबल डेवलपमेंट करना है तो ये कल्चर में आना चाहिए ऑर्गेनाइजेशन के कि उसके एम्प्लॉय खुद होके वॉलेंटरीली अपना समय दे टाइम इज मोस्ट इम्पॉर्टेंट मोस्ट वेल्यूएबल थिंग जो सी एस आर में सबसे बड़ी दिक्कत जो आती है लोग संडे छुट्टी का दिन है कोई संडे को घर में बैठ के आराम से टीवी देखेंगे कौन जाएगा पर हमारे जो एम्प्लॉयज है उनको मोटिवेट किया गया है और उनको हम सपोर्ट करते हैं पर वो अपना समय देते हैं अपना पैसा भी खर्च करते हैं और इस प्रकार हमारे कंपनी में पांच जो है पांच सोशल क्लब्स हैं या पांच एन जी समाज या ट्रस्ट हैं और कुछ ये हैं संस्थाएं जो बहुत अच्छा काम कर रही है और हम उनको बहुत अच्छा सपोर्ट करते हैं और उनको हाईलाइट भी करते हैं जब भी मौका मिले so um, again i'll just answer your question on employee volunteerism so it um, is a different question whether it is isn't how it contributes to csr but employee volunteerism in modo phone per se has a long legacy it is culturally embedded and we have a program called world of difference where uh, 50 employees are chosen through a very competitive kind of process and they go and spend 8 weeks in different ngos giving their capacities we feel that two ways uh, that employees can really contribute is one with their skill set and secondly by offering to sort of you know um, set in place um, uh, structures process and policies that they have and by <coughs> their experiences and their journeys so um, there's short term volunteering called raise your hand where for 45 minutes old phone employees go and teach road safety environmental education in neighborhood schools but more strategically the world of difference gives an employee for 8 weeks to an ngo we choose to believe this makes a difference because when somebody comes in as your communications manager or finance manager or hr manager and looks at your ecosystems and helps strengthen them or conducts trainings i think it adds a different kind of value but on the converse side on the corporate side it has huge impact in terms of motivation and sense of pride towards one's own organization and i think even if you look at it from a business perspective it really lends understanding of different ecosystems so a marketing individual who is very used to say functioning in mumbai because this is a uh, you know uh, state agnostic this program could actually go to peepli and do something or go to you know uh, assam and do something but he also understands what assam is all about what this you know what this wonderful country and its various geographies are about so net that i think um, it's a culture thing and in modo phone we take great pride in a culture of employee volunteerism so i come to you know in manchu let let uh, start <laughs> more from a uh, one thing to but this sort of organization corporate organization culture definitely people are doing that yeah so uh, coming back to uh, uh, as i told there is a model where Uh, our uh, branches actually participate in uh, local level events, local level uh, awareness campaigns, uh, and we don't hire people from outside from for that we, because it's a, such a large scale. Pan India, our employees actually go there; they get motivated. Uh, I uh, we've actually received very good comments from the employees as well, where. they feel connected to the bank uh, much more uh, because the bank is doing some things uh, and involving them as well in uh, say national level awareness campaign on uh, if i say uh, world environment day so uh, these things actually play a lot of uh, uh, role in uh, employee retention as well if it goes back but as part of csr it, it might not be always uh, they might not be involving all the projects Uh, so my understanding is that the clause in itself does not allow for the mo- it's about ruby expenditure and it doesn't allow for monetization or voluntary time that said uh, i have been speaking to a lot of organizations one on one and i have never till today heard any corporate say we have stopped in- involving our employees uh just because the csr act doesn't recognize it because the drivers of employee voluntary are very different from the drivers of csr expenditure right the reasons com- the reason companies companies have been looking 
at employer warranty historically is because it drives retention, because it creates pride in brand, like Madhu expanded on, right? So the drivers are different. So companies are continuing to do that, irrespective of the fact that the CSR Act does not recognize it as a monetary contribution. Yeah. Yeah. Good. So, so I will, this is my last comment and we'll close the panel. My last comment is when you look at the section 135, the interpretation and you read with the, with the rules with a, in a combined view, uh, your voluntary contribution through a voluntary or the, or the money spent through them cannot exceed 5% which is, the, which is part of the CSR. If you want your volunteers to work and monetize in, in some form or some hours or some days, it is not possible. In this form, it was, uh, the rule came, but they had then deleted in the next subsequent, on 17 September last year, that the whole rule that this will be read as the following is, this contribution will be part of 5% and not part of the CSR expenditure. So that's what we will do. And thank you so much. And I thank the panelists. I'm sorry, this is a very uh, different kind of style of, of panel because I, I wanted this panel to be you know, more answerable, accountable to your questions. So thank you so much. It was a pleasure talking to you and also you know, to the panelists. Thank you so much.